intro folks. Um, this is Professor Carberry and this will be our first um, lecture PowerPoint. This is fall 2020, August. We're in this wild crazy time where we have the pandemic coronavirus that has us, a lot of us still all sheltering in place. Um, um, we have closed the campus so we're doing our general microbiology class both lecture and lab online, so it's it's going to be interesting and challenging, but I know we can do it. And um, apologies, you guys, we have a little bit of a, of a zoo or a barnyard here with our animals, and our wonderful dog, Brew, is barking in the background, so I apologize for that, and hopefully he can, hopefully he'll calm down here. Um, so this is um, Biological Sciences 440 General Microbiology, and I will be both your lecture and your lab leader. All right. Um, so so welcome, you guys. Let's just go ahead and dive in on this first um, lecture unit 1.1, kind of an introduction to microbiology. Let's see if we can't go full screen. Good job, you guys. Um, just really quickly, you guys. My background is um, I've always been interested in. Um, animals um, and um, went to veterinary school, but my interest was a little bit different. I was more interested in um, animals that can act as reservoirs for diseases that can be transferred to humans, and those are called zoonoses. So when I did my Doctor of Vet Medicine degree at UC Davis, I combined it with the veterinary equivalent of a Master's of um, Public Health, and in vet medicine that's called a Master's of Preventive Vet Medicine. And initially, I wanted to do international work, um, work in developing countries, doing community education to work to control the spread of zoonotic diseases. Um, but um, um, while I was in graduate school back at Cornell University, um, I had both of our, our children, who are now adults, it's hard to believe, and, and I discovered as a, um, as a mom trying to go to school and work and raise um, little children, even with all the modern conveniences. We had running water, we had a, um, a washer, a dryer. It was still so hard, and so I decided probably doing international work with little children, maybe be that might be beyond my capabilities. So I thought, what, what, what was it about that um, career? that really intrigued me, and basically it was um, community education, health education, and so I just feel like I'm like one of the luckiest people in the world that I get to teach you all about microbiology. Um, not only the, the so-called bad microbes, um, those that cause infectious disease or other harm, but also about the good microbiology. I'm, I'm doing a voice, I'm doing a voice recording, I'm doing a voiceover right now. Sorry, you guys, so now the cat's coming in and meowing. <laughs> so, you guys, it is a zoo here. My husband's working at home, my daughter's working at home. So I'm sure you're going to get to meet everybody. And that's our cat, Lenore, who is in a few of the lab videos. I'm, I'm, I think she wants to become a microbiologist at heart. Okay, so here we go, you guys. So, throughout this course, we're going to ask ourselves, you know, why do we care? Are we only taking this course because it's a prerequisite for maybe a nursing program or dental hygiene? Um, but I think you of all folks, um, with what you've already experienced <clears throat> with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the emergence of the SARS coronavirus um, 2 um, as a major cause of illness, debility, and death wor worldwide, y you all know why microbiology is, is so important. Some microbes can cause serious harm. They can, they can harm us, they can kill us. And again, folks, I know that's that's usually what we think about when we think of microbes is how harmful they are. But I hope before the course is over, you'll also see that microbes may offer the solution to many of the huge issues that are facing us, not only with regard to infectious disease, but with regard to pollution and alternate energy sources. So um, we want to make sure we get right down to the basics. And folks, hopefully these PowerPoint slides follow the um, study guide questions. And indeed, you guys, when I write our lecture exams and lecture quizzes, I try to have the study guide questions right in front of me. And so I use the study guide questions to create our lecture quiz and exam questions. So I think the study, study guide questions could really help you a great deal. Okay, so you guys, so what is microbiology? 
and it's the study of microbes or microorganisms. And um, microorganisms comes from the, the Greek mikros, which means small. So we could say that um, microorganisms or microbes are organisms or agents too small to be seen with the naked eye. And the resolving power of our naked of the naked eye, meaning an eye without any kind of magnifying de device, is about 100 to 200 micrometers. So we would say that most microbes, most microorganisms, are smaller than about 100 to 200 micrometers. We're going to have to have a magnifying device like a microscope to visualize them. Um, and again, folks, this is just this resolving power of the human eye without a magnifying device, a so-called naked eye, is around 100 to 200 micrometers. And, and folks, this will be important um, throughout the course is to know um, the value of a micrometer, and this is how we abbreviate it. So a micrometer is 10 to the negative sixth meter, so that's really small. And one micrometer, you guys, this is kind of your average um, size of your so-called average bacterium, like good old E. coli. So for many years, um, historically, people didn't know about microbes because they were so small. You know, as humans, it's like, well, if I can't see it, I won't believe in it, right? So this was a huge issue and contributed to a lot of the suffering um, and lack of progress early on in microbiology because we didn't have microscopes, right? So we do want to remember, you guys, that most mi microbes we can't see with the naked eye, right? And um, the way we visualize microbes is using microscopes, and there's different types of um, light microscopes we can use to examine bacteria and um, other cellular microbes. We'd, use a, we'd need to use a more powerful electron microscope here if we're going to look at viruses. So we'll see that viruses are even smaller. Here's our bacterium around one micrometer. And we're going to see even the largest viruses, such as a smallpox virus, is smaller than most bacteria. So with the exception of the pox virus family, which we may just be able to see with a light microscope, most other viruses, for example, polio virus, um, influenza virus, we would use a, we would need a much more powerful microscope, an electron microscope. So for example, folks, if we were actually doing face-to-face -face labs with our light microscopes, um, we would be able to visualize bacteria, but we wouldn't be able to see to visualize most viruses, right? So for most viruses, we're going to have to use an electron microscope. And indeed, um, here folks, here's another question. Are some microbes even smaller than the smallest cells? Well, if we say that our bacteria and another group um, of organisms called the archaea, if these are some of our smallest cellular organisms, are their microbes even smaller? And the answer is yes. For example, our viruses, right? Smallpox, um, influenza virus, polioviruses, they're all smaller than the smaller cellular microbe, right? And later folks will be talking about disease-causing prions, which are simply misfolded um, proteins. And we'll see they're way smaller um, than even our viruses. So the answer to, are some microbes even smaller than the smallest cells? The answer is yes. And down here, folks, um, just some cool information. Relative sizes of various microscopic and non-microscopic objects. Note that a typical virus measures about 100 nanometers, 10 times smaller than a typical bacterium. And a typical bacterium is at least 10 times smaller than a typical plant or animal cell. Right? So, and again, folks, we just want to stress that an object must measure 100 to 200 micrometers to be visible without a microscope. And again, this is why it took many, many years for us to make advances in microbiology, because it took a long time for us to invent the microscopes that we could use to visualize them. And again, folks, we're always wondering, you know, why do we care about microbiology? So this was, oh my, this, the computer is taking over here. <laughs> So you guys, a couple of summer, summers ago, no, a couple of winters ago, um, our family was able to visit um, um, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I didn't know this, you guys, I feel ashamed to say this, but um, in Amsterdam, there is the world's only um, microbe museum called Micropia. And um, again, it, this is the Museum of Microbes, the only museum of microbes in the world, which is so cool. And I got to go, which was so exciting. I was like in heaven. And so folks, um, most, most of the next slides are taken from the Micropia Museum of Microbes, their website. And they just did such a smashing job to 
convey some really important and cool facts about microbes and microbiology to the public. So I have pirated a lot of their information and just wanted to share it with you here because I think they just present it so beautifully. And, and folks, I apologize. I know you can read, but I'm going to go ahead and read, read this because I just love it. Okay, so microbes, you can't see them, but they're here. They're on you and in you. And you've got more than a hundred thousand billion of them. They're with you when you eat, when you breathe, when you kiss. They are everywhere on your hands and in your belly and in your belly button. And they meddle in everything. They shape your world, what you smell, what you taste, whether you get sick or get better. They can save us or destroy us. Microbes, the most the smallest and most powerful organisms on our planet. And this was this cool glass Ebola virus. We know very little about them, really, but we can learn so much from them about our health, alternative energy sources, and much more. When you look from really close, a new world is revealed to you, more beautiful and spectacular than you could ever have imagined. Welcome to Microbia. There, you, there we are. We're ten times more microbial than humans, right? So again, what are microorganisms or microbes? They're so small you can't even see them. Those who think a flea is small are about to enter a whole new world, the world of microorganisms. A microorganism or microbe is a creature that is too small to be seen with the naked eye. They're so small, in fact, that a million bacteria, one of the smallest microbes, can fit on the tip of a pin. And here's an electron micrograph showing a non-sterilized tip of a needle and seeded, covered with all of these bacteria. Right? So just giving us an idea of how tiny they are. Two-thirds of life is invisible. When you look around, you see trees, plants, perhaps some birds. These organisms are visible to the naked eye. For a long time, scientists thought that nature was made up of only these visible things. Today we know better. Two-thirds of life on Earth is, is microbial, microorganisms, which again cannot be seen without a microscope. So folks, we're going to come back to this. This is a, what's called a phylogenetic tree of life. Phylogeny is evolutionary relationships between organisms. So this is the so-called tree of life of cellular organisms, right? So notice you guys, viruses aren't included on the tree, nor will disease-causing prions. So these are just cellular organisms. And the way this tree is organized, we, we have down here at the base of the tree, Luca, the last universal common ancestor. For as biologists, we believe we all share the same common ancestor, thus explaining the unity of all cellular organisms, all life here on Earth. We are all truly related. We are truly one family. And then folks will see on the phylogenetic tree, if we think of time as um, on, say, the y-axis going up like here from this is in the past, right, about maybe 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago, and then as we move upward, right, time progresses until present time, we'll see this branching of the tree of life into three big groups called three domains. And we'll see, folks, that this great branching, this great diversification of life here on Earth is a product of uh, mutations and what we call horizontal gene transfer and sexual reproduction. And it's also a product of this amazing process called natural selection where the environment chooses the genetic variants best adapted to a particular ecological niche, a, a, a particular environment. So as microbes moved into all these different habitats on Earth through natural selection, right, the genetic variants were chosen that could best adapt to that environment. And thus we get this great diversification of the tree of life, right? And as a result, we end up with the incredible diversity of organisms here on Earth. So the tree of life also helps us understand the diversity of cellular organisms here on Earth. And without diversity, you guys, we're not going to survive. We absolutely have to have diversity if we're going to survive. They're small but mighty. What microorganisms lack in size, they make up for in numbers. Your body is full of microbes, even though you are not aware of them. More than 100 trillion, 100 trillion microbes live on and in your body. That's 10 times more than the number of actual body cells and 14,000 times more than the number of people on Earth. And this, you guys, was, was so exciting. Um, when the human microbiome, now called our other genome, 
um, was cataloged. And um, the human microbiome, folks, is all the microbes that live on and within us. And initially, most of the emphasis was done on trying to identify the members of our intestinal or gut microbiome. And again, folks, um, the results were staggering. So it was from this NIH Human Microbiome Project. Um, the results suggested that for every human cell, right, we have 10 microbes that live on or within us. So if, if we have 25,000 human genes, we are carrying bacteria, which together have a million genes. So again, you guys, we're gonna, we're gonna be exploring how um, our microbes, our microbiome, influence our health, they influence our behavior. I um, mean, again, some people say, well, as a human, we're really more of a multi-organism animal. And, and again, folks, we could argue, well, we have, we're 10 times more microbial than we are human. And again, we're just starting to explore how the microbes influence our health and our behavior. The microbes are small, but they come in great numbers. On our planet, 60% of the biomass, living and dead organic matter, material is made up of microbes. That's more than people, animals, plants, trees, and insects combined. There are a nonillion, that's a one with 30 zeros, a nonillion bacteria living on Earth, far more than the number of stars in the universe. That's mind-blowing. The number of viruses is even larger than the number of bacteria. In one drop of seawater, there are around a million bacteria and 10 million viruses in one drop of seawater. Viruses, therefore, are the most common biological entity on the planet. And again, folks, we're just starting to understand how viruses influence life on Earth in, in bad ways, which we know, but also in good ways. And this is just a um, photomicrograph of some of the microbes we can find in water. And this is, these are primarily bacteria from a water sample. Without microorganisms like molds, yeasts, microalgae, bacteria, archaea, viruses, and microanimals like protozoa, life on Earth would not be possible. First life. Microorganisms were the first life on Earth. Without them, there could be no life on the planet. Origins of microbes, origins of life on Earth. When did the first cellular microbes evolve, and how did they change Earth? So you guys, this is these are really important um, facts. These um, these questions usually end up on lecture quizzes and on our lecture exams. So this is information um, you definitely want to know. So folks, if we look at um, the origin and evolution of life here on Earth, right? We kind of look at it almost like a clock here, right? So um, we're starting with the origin of Earth about 4.6 billion years ago. And the estimate is the first cellular organisms, unicellular bacteria, evolved about 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago. So BYA is a billion years ago. And I think they also use the term giga, okay, for giga years. And folks, what we'll, um, we'll be exploring further is that when the first um, cellular organism, the first bacteria evolved here on Earth, there was no molecular oxygen present, no free molecular oxygen. So we see we had an anoxic or anaerobic environment. So um, the conditions on early primitive Earth were very different than they, than they are today, right? So we would say when the first um, living things evolved, they evolved in an anaerobic atmosphere, right? No O2 present. There were other gases, for example, molecular nitrogen, CO2, and methane in the atmosphere, but no uh, molecular oxygen. And then this incredible event happened, folks. There was the evolution of a photosynthetic pigment called chlorophyll A, and the first bacteria to evolve chlorophyll A are these amazing group of bacteria we'll be looking at more in lab called cyanobacteria. And what's so amazing about chlorophyll A is it permits a brand new process to occur. And this process is called oxygenic, oxygen generating, oxygen making photosynthesis. So it, it was with the evolution of cyanobacteria and the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. And one estimate is maybe around 2.6 billion years ago, slowly molecular oxygen started to accumulate in our atmosphere. Very, very slowly it accumulated. So Earth's atmosphere slowly was switched from anaerobic or anoxic to aerobic or oxygen-containing. 
And this had a huge impact on the evolution of life on Earth because it permitted evolution of an incredible process called aerobic respiration, which we, we will really dive into in our metabolism section. And here, folks, um, we see this term, origin of eukaryotes, and we might say, well, you know, well, what's a eukaryote? Eu means true or good. Karyote comes from the root for a nut or a kernel, and the nut or kernel we're interested in within a cell as biologists is the nucleus. So it wasn't until, what, about two billion years ago, right, after oxygenic photosynthesis evolved, that we see the origin of eukaryotes, which are cellular organisms which have a true um, membrane-bound nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles such as mitochondrial chloroplasts. And you guys, we are eukaryotes, right? Humans, animals, or eukaryotes. Now what about what about the unicellular organisms that had, had evolved before then? So bacteria and another group of organisms called the archaea, they are what we call prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are single-celled or unicellular organisms which lack a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. They do have chromosomal DNA, it's just not contained in the membrane-bound nucleus. So all of the organisms, folks, that we'll be talking about that first evolved, these are all prokaryotes, right? And later, the much more complicated eukaryotes evolved, right? And here's another exciting event, you guys. These are um, photosynthetic eukaryotes, the algae that we'll talk about. And look here, you guys, we're accumulating oxygen, accumulating oxygen, until we reach about it present uh, in our present atmosphere, our present air, we have about 21% oxygen, right? And again, folks, here we probably won't be getting into any of these um, multicellular um, eukaryotes, the Shelly invert Shelly <laughs> invertebrates that contain shells, Shelly invertebrates, vascular plants, mammals, which we are animals which have mammary glands and of course humans but what's so cool you guys look at this humans evolved almost like you know a second before midnight in this great clock of the origin of light so we're real newcomers here on earth right so again folks we're going to spend most of our time at least in lecture we're going to spend most of our time talking about bacteria and the bacteria you guys as you can see here they have survived through all these major changes here on earth right just amazing so again, folks, just kind of the factoids that you want to remember. If, if we ask when did the first cellular microbes evolve, so that would be around six, excuse me, 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago. And then if we, if we were to ask you how did the microbes change um, Earth, so remember, you guys, when the first um, microbes evolved, the first bacteria evolved, Earth's atmosphere was anoxic or anaerobic. There was no free O2. So remember when those cyanobacteria evolved, and again, you guys, if you read different books or different papers, there's a range. Some people think um, oxygenate photosynthesis may have evolved as early as 2.6 billion years ago, and then others stayed around 2.3 billion years ago. But remember, you guys, what's important is cyanobacteria were the first organisms that evolved chlorophyll A, and thus they were the first organisms to um, carry out oxygenate photosynthesis, oxygen, making photosynthesis and through oxygenic photosynthesis Earth's atmosphere slowly accumulated oxygen and became aerobic and again folks our modern atmosphere contains about 21 percent molecular oxygen so this you guys is just some example of the beautiful cyanobacteria that will be uh, we'll be looking at, at some of these beautiful little guys in lab um, they are bacteria um, in the old days, they were called blue-green algae because sometimes they appear kind of bluish-green. And in the old days, they thought they were algae. Um, but remember, you guys, algae are eukaryotes and cyanobacteria are prokaryotes, right? So the better name is cyanobacteria. The, the photosynthetic pigment, you guys, they evolved was chlorophyll A. And remember, chlorophyll A permits oxygenic photosynthesis. And this is just a little summary, you guys. So in oxygenic photosynthesis, the little guys take inorganic carbon dioxide from the air and water and with the chlorophyll A right and the presence of light and chlorophyll A they can reduce the carbon dioxide into organic molecules like glucose and another end product when they strip off all the hydrogen and high energy electrons from water you end up with the water oxidized and we get a, a waste product end product of molecular oxygen and thus oxygenic photosynthesis just an amazing process 
And then folks just looking at um, microbial diversity, they're so well adapted. Microorganisms live everywhere around us, including on and in our bodies, as we mentioned. During the 3.5 to 3.6 billion years they've lived on Earth, they've been able to adapt to almost every environment through the workings of evolution. And folks, biological evolution is a change in the genetic makeup of a population of organisms over time. They, the microbes, are now able to survive under the most extreme conditions from those in hot geysers to those in ice cold waters of the Antarctic. It's just amazing. We find microbes everywhere, it seems, even deep in the earth. Wherever there is food, there is also life, and microbes eat almost anything, even metals, acid, petroleum, and natural gas. And so, you guys, microbes have great capacity to help in an amazing process called bioremediation, the ability to take toxins and pollutes, um, pollutants and detoxify them. So microbes could help us clean up pollution. Microbes spread and adapt to new environments and they evolved into new species. How? Through um, the process of mutations. And folks, mutations is when whenever cells are getting ready to divide in two, they have to copy their chromosomal DNA. And although they do a pretty good job copying their chromosomal DNA, always there'll be some mistakes. And those mistakes in the DNA sequence are called mutations. And usually we think, oh, they're bad. But you guys, sometimes mutations can be good. The mutants might have special abilities to survive in an ever-changing environment. So mutations, you guys, is crucial for biological evolution to occur. And then folks will discover that bacteria discovered ways to share DNA with one another. Um, and another cool process that um, that multicellular um, eukaryotes can carry out is a process of sexual reproduction, where again, we're combining genetic information from two different organisms. And this is so cool, you guys will be exploring this endosymbiosis. This is when one organism takes up another organism. The other organism lives inside that first organism and they create this um, symbiotic relationship. Symbiosis meaning when two different organisms live together. And indeed you guys, this is absolutely wild, we're going to discover that the mitochondria that we have in our cells evolve through endosymbiosis from primitive aerobic respiring bacteria. And the chloroplasts that we find in eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms evolve from primitive endosymbiotic cyanobacteria. This is just the wildest stuff, you guys, right? So what's the result of mutations and exchange and recombining DNA and having endosymbiotic relationship? We end up with this incredible diversity of life on Earth depicted in those fantastic trees of life. So again, folks, this is, um, as you know, in science classes, biology classes, vocabulary is really, really important. So what is biological evolution? It's changes in the genetic makeup of a population of organisms over time. And how does that happen? Well, one way is the process called natural selection, where the environment selects which genetic variants are best adapted to that particular environment. Right? And, and so as a result of natural selection and other processes, you guys, we end up with biological evolution. The microbes become better adapted to their unique environments, um, or the organisms become better adapted to their unique environments, and that's what leads to the incredible diversity of life. Yeah. So, and in, in indeed, you guys, genetic diversity is absolutely essential for populations of organisms to survive. So when we talk about how crucial diversity is, I mean, we are talking about survival of populations, right? Um, we absolutely need to, we absolutely need diversity if we're going to survive. And, and indeed, you guys, another topic we'll explore is whether human, human activities can change which variants in an environment are selected. And we're going to ask ourselves, can humans influence natural selection? Can we, um, can we influence biological evolution? And unfortunately, you guys, the answer is yes. And the example we're going to use over and over again is the inappropriate and overuse of antibiotics by humans. Um, in this way, we've changed the environment so that we're going to end up selecting for antibiotic-resistant bacteria or drug-resistant pathogens. And this is can have devastating effects. So this will be a kind of another theme throughout the course, is how humans can, by overusing antimicrobial drugs, select for drug-resistant um, pathogens. 
So again, folks, the, this is just another example of the uh, of a phylogenetic tree, a fancier one. Um, I just love these. So remember, folks, um, the the tree of life helps us understand the unity of life because we are all descendants from those first primitive cellular organisms. We are all truly family, right? We all share that common ancestor, that last universal common ancestor, Luca, and thus we share, for example, many metabolic processes with bacteria because we have the same ancestors. And then you guys, the tree, the incredible branching of the tree helps us understand the diversity of life, that incredible process where organisms, genetic variants adapted to the many, many different habitats here on Earth and through the process of um, natural selection is one of the driving forces. The best adapted organism survived, had more offspring, passed on their unique genes, and thus we have this great branching or diversification of life here on Earth, which just makes life so fantastic. Um, on this phylogenetic tree of life, folks, I'll just throw this in here right now. You'll see there's three major branches, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. These three major um, branches or, or groups are called domains, right? So all cellular organisms can be grouped into domain bacteria, domain archaea, or domain eukarya. Um, so you'll need to know those domains. And also something I'll ask you is in which domain or, domain or domains are prokaryotes found? And folks, remember that prokaryotes are found in domain bacteria and domain archaea. Okay. And if I ask you where are eukaryotes found, all the eukaryotes are found in domain eukarya. And you guys, this is where we belong. Um, so we are animals, and specifically we are mammals. We are organisms that have mammary glands to produce milk for our babies, right? So humans are mammals, and there's many other mammals that, that you're probably aware of. Um, in microbiology, folks, we will be studying um, multicellular organisms as hosts for um, disease-causing microbes, pathogens, right? Um, and also, folks, on we'll also be d um, exploring some parasitic worms that can cause harm, parasitic helminths. And the reason we often study these guys is they usually have um, some stage in their life cycle, which is microscopic, either like eggs, for example, that you have to use a microscope to see, or maybe some immature forms like larvae that you have to have a microscope to see. So historically, um, parasitic worms or helminths are often studied in microbiology. Down here, folks, in the eukaryote, we can see some of the um, eukaryotic, um, eukaryotic microbes. So these little guys down here, the flagellates and ciliates, um, we'll be describing these as animal, animal like what we call protists, usually unicellular eukaryotes, yeah, here. And then we'll, we probably won't talk much about the algae, but we'll mention them a little bit. We will talk a lot, especially in lab, about fungi, so um, yeasts, molds, and fleshy fungi like, like mushrooms. Oh, and here's another animal like protist over here, you guys, amoeba. For, for most of the lecture course, you guys, we're going to be over here in domain bacteria. So this is where we're going to spend most of our time is in domain bacteria, right? One reason, you guys, we don't spend more time um, in domain eukarya and especially in domain um, animalia, for example, talking about humans, is that most of you have had or will have two semesters of anatomy and physiology. And that's two semesters just fo focusing on a, excuse me, unicellular, a multicellular eukaryotic organism, um, humans, right? So we, we end up spending more of our time over here. And again, you guys, this incredible microbial diversity arises as the microbes adapt to new habitats. And again, this is from microbe, you guys. It's just amazing, right? And, and indeed, folks, here, this is kind of an inverted tree of life what Micropia did is they highlighted in yellow all the branches of the tree of life that are microbes. And, in, and again, you guys, it, it shows us that most of uh, most of the members of the tree of life, they're microbes, right? They're microorganisms. And it's only these, these white branches over here that aren't microbial. And again, folks, the, this is important information. So the three domains of cellular organisms, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, Right? So you want to remember that. Carl Woese developed the uh, three-domain system of classification using ribosomal RNA sequencing. 
And again, folks, this is just going over some of the, um, the important vocabulary. So remember, bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes, meaning they lack a cell nucleus, but they do have a chromosome made of DNA. Eukarya have a cell nucleus, right? They're called eukaryotes. Um, and within the nucleus, the chromosomal DNA is kept. Um, bacteria and archaea are all unicellular, made of one cell. Eukarya can be unicellular or multicellular. Okay? All multicellular organisms, including humans, belong to the eukarya domain. And this is just a micropial link, you guys, so you can, they have photos and descriptions of ev almost every microbe that we know of. Okay. And just a little bit more here, you guys, so living or not, as opposed to all s other sorts of microbes on Earth, viruses are not represented in the tree of life. Viruses don't swim, they don't eat, they don't grow, and they can't reproduce independently. They don't have metabolism, they don't have cell membranes. And indeed, you guys, we call viruses obligate intracellular parasites. They rely on um, a living host, another cell that they have to invade before they can replicate. Because they lack key characteristics of cellular organisms, many scientists do not recognize viruses as living organisms. And indeed, you guys probably would all, excuse me, all refer to viruses as microbes um, or microbial agents. Some people say to be a microorganism, you have to be cellular. So we'll, we'll try to make them happy and call viruses microbial agents instead. So indeed, you guys, we are truly living on the planet of the microbes. So folks, um, I'll close this PowerPoint now. And then the next PowerPoint is going to be microbial phenomenon. So I changed the order a little bit, you guys. So the next PowerPoint, Unit 1.2, is going to be microbial phenomenon. Just, just a few examples of what microbes do. And then the PowerPoint Unit 1.3 is the cast of characters. And this has a lot of information in it, you guys. There's lots of classification. So don't leave this till the night before, like the lecture quiz or the lecture exam, because this is a lot of information to know. And then, folks, the unit 1.4 is a brief microbial history. So some of the um, important folks in microbiology history. Um, and again, folks, there's um, study guide questions for all of these. And for the history, the history um, portion, you guys, there's also a practice microbial history quiz, which I highly recommend that you take. Anytime I offer a practice quiz, you guys, I really encourage you um, to take the practice quiz. There's no points associated with it. It's just to help you. And the um, practice micro history quiz, you guys, it has a key with it. So hopefully that will help you learn those historical figures. Okay, folks, so I'm hoping this recorded. I'm never sure when I'm doing these quick time movies. So I'm going to hope that this recorded, and it looks like maybe it didn't. So that's kind of a bummer. Let's see here. Okay, you guys. All right, so hopefully this recorded, you guys, and we'll be seeing you in the next PowerPoint.